Welcome back guys. So today I'm actually gonna be redoing an old video that I did, one of my very first ones, but it is a very important video because it's a part of my five top selling projects and it is this garden trellis. So in the original video, it was very poorly made and I actually made a couple of mistakes. It's, it's like the old one if you could decipher it, uh, but I'm gonna go into more detail about the jigs, the jigs that I actually used to make this for mass producing. I'll go through step by step of actually what you need to do to make this in the shortest amount of time because time is money. And I'll actually explain each jig to you to show you how fast that you can actually make these. So these are all part of the jig system that I have set up for making these trellises. I'll also explain to you how I sell them. I'm getting a lot of questions on where's the best places to market these. We'll go over all of that. I know these things look simple, but for mass production, there are a ton of little tips and tricks that I'm gonna show you to pump these things out to make the most amount of money. I've had a ton of people comment and they would ask for plans for this stuff. I'm going to show you exactly how to make this. You do not need the plans for it because I'm gonna show you how to. I'm gonna give you every single cut. I'm gonna put everything in the description, but if you decide that you would like the plan, some people love to have the paper right in front of them. I actually have um, a plan made for this and the garden obelisk, obelisk, still can't say it right whatever this thing is that looks super cool with all the vines and stuff growing up. This thing, have plans for both of these on my shop. I'll drop the link in the description. So before we hop right into the build, let's talk about some of the questions that I have received about both of these items is where to sell these. And that's a very important question. Uh, the top two questions that I've had is where to sell these and what type of wood should you use for this? Should you put a stain on it? Should you put some type of outdoor treatment on them? Um, so let's talk about both of those. Where should you sell these? These items are big. I mean, look at this thing. It's, it's taller than I am. So these type of items are what I would consider to be local sales. You can put them online, you can put them on Facebook, you can put them on Marketplace, or what we have had the best luck with, my kids actually make these to sell, is going to your local farm and garden stores. So if you're doing this to make money, if you're doing this as a side hustle, which this is a very high profit side hustle, go to your local farm and garden stores, go to your local greenhouses, approach them with this. Once they see the quality of this thing, they are used to seeing all of this stuff that's shipped in from overseas that is super low quality. Every single place that we have taken these to, they have been blown away by the quality, by the thickness of the material. It's actually real wood. It's thick wood. It actually has five of the different fans versus the four. To kind of get our foot in the door with these type of items, approach them with like a no risk type of pitch. So they're already impressed, okay? They see this thing, they see how heavy duty that it is, they want it. So now you have to be able to sell it. What we do is we say, hey, I'm gonna bring you 10 of these things. I want, and I'm just gonna throw some numbers out here, Everyone's time is different and depending on where you're at depends on what you can get out of these. Around our area, we get around $50. Now that's our price. What they sell them for is up to them. I've had comments online, you know, I had a guy DM me the other day, he said, hey, I've started making these and I've already sold a few of them for, it was like $125 a piece. Get what you can get out of them. Test the market, test the waters out there. But what we do, approach the companies and say, I'm gonna drop off 10 of these things. You don't pay me anything until they sell. So by using that type of approach, these businesses see a no loss opportunity. If they do not sell, they're not out any money, but they always sell. So I say 50 bucks is what I want out of it. You put whatever you want. If you would like to put $75 on it, put $75 on it. You keep anything over the $50. You pay me once they've sold. And they always call back. I've sold out. You know, I need more. I have people asking for these. They have waiting lists. That's our approach. Your approach may be totally different, but it works in our area. The second question that I'm going to cover is what type of weather resistance should you put on this? Okay, so anything that makes ground contact, if it's untreated material, anything that makes ground contact, that is what will rot. So as long as you have adequate airflow around an item, they will last. Think of log cabins, things like that. You know, not treated material, 
air is flowing around them, they last for years and years. If you're going to paint stain, do it while you have your parts and pieces. Do not do it once it is assembled. It is 10 times easier to stain something, paint something, while it's in parts. And then you can go back and touch up any areas as you need to after that. So you can choose to make this out of cedar or you can choose to make it out of any other type of weather resistant wood, just natural weather resistant wood. Of course, that is gonna increase your production price. So you will have to increase your final price. As for myself, I just use pine. This obelisk or whatever it is, this thing, this one is a year old. This was one of the first ones that I made. I actually went and stole it out of my mother's garden. So if I'm not here next week, you know why. So it's gonna be completely up to you and what you do with this or what the customer wants. If the customer is ordering several and they have specific things that they want, then do it, but charge for it. So let me go over all of the parts for this build and then we will get into the jigs and assembly. You're gonna be amazed at how fast these things can go together once you have your jigs made. All of this material is going to be made out of an inch and a half so you can use two by fours and rip them down inch and a half material that is going to be ripped down to five eight go a little lighter than that if you wanted to do half inch i like the five eight it makes for a lot more sturdy impressive trellis so five base material my material will look a little bit different if you follow my channel you know i like to work with a lot of reclaimed material you're going to need five of the 72 inch long boards that are inch and a half by five eights you're gonna need one board that is 34 inches long. Again, the same dimension as everything. Any wood that I mention, except for maybe the you know jigs and things like that, will be the inch and a half by five eighths. This is where I messed up in my very first video. Again, I was no excuses. You know, I shouldn't have put it out if you know there was an error in it, but I did not know the error until it was pointed out. I told people in the voiceover that this board was 40 inches long. It was not 40 inches long, it was 32 inches long. I don't even know where I got 40. So with the learning curve of making these videos, I have gotten better. At least I would like to think that I have. I'm now very conscious about that and try to make sure that I tell you exactly everything in case people are actually building from these videos instead of the plans. You will need two boards that are 12 inches long. Okay, and these are gonna be the bottoms of our trellis. As far as hardware goes, you are going to need one and a quarter inch deck screws. So these things will not rust like the, uh, let's say if you're using just regular wood screws. So one and a quarter inch, I like to use the star head uh, deck screws. You will also need bolts. You'll need two bolts for the bottom. These are three eighths inch bolts that are four inches long. You're gonna need two of those. You're gonna need a three eighths inch drill bit. And you are also going to need, because we pre-drill and countersink all of these, a bit that will actually do both at the same time, or you're gonna need a drill bit and a countersink bit, or you can countersink just with a larger drill bit. For this video, I'm just gonna be showing you how to do it just with a regular drill bit and a countersink bit. The rest of the tools are just gonna be drill, driver, wrenches. We'll use a couple clamps. So the first step is this. You have all of your parts cut. And whenever I like to mass produce to actually sell these, just like I've said in my other videos if you are going to set up to make one because the first one is always the hardest to make set up to make 10 set up to make five and in this case if you have access to the material set up to make 20 30 whatever that you would like with the jig system and i'm going to show you here it's it's super fast so have all of your parts cut it does not take long to rip down this material bundle them up into bundles of five and you can just line them on the wall, however, and you make your building kits. So once I have all of my parts cut, I like to pre-drill and countersink all of my parts right from the beginning. I don't like to do it as I am assembling. If I have 10 of these to pre-drill hose and to countersink in, I can set up a station, do it all at once. Let's start pre-drilling. So the first thing that I like to do is to take my five long boards and let's get them attached. That way that they're not just kind of everywhere. We can get these together and out of the way. We just line them up. And when you're going through these different boards, try to find material that has the least amount of knots in it as possible because we're going to be bending this. And any time that you have a knot in a piece of wood, it, you know, it kind of makes a weak point. And we do not want a weak point in this. But if you find one that has a big knot in it, put it towards the center because it's gonna have the least amount of bend. The outside boards should have the least amount of knots or no knots at all, if possible. So we're just gonna line this end up. And then I like to put a clamp on once everything is lined up. This is just gonna hold everything together 
while we attach this by drilling our holes in the end and keep all of this from shifting. I like to put one on both sides. Okay, so this is nice and flush. Let's go ahead and put some bolts in this. Now these bolt holes are gonna be an inch and a quarter from the bottom and two and a quarter. Since these are three eighths bolts, I'm gonna be using a three eighths a little bit. Yes, it will be a little tight, but you do not want it to be loose. Now we will just put our nuts on. And now that these are ran through, you can actually undo your clamp. You can undo your clamps, turn it to the side to do your tightening. I'm just using two ratchets uh, just for speed. That way I can actually do both directions at once. You can use a end wrench, whatever you like. You can actually use a chuck that goes onto your drill or impact driver if you'd like as well. Now let's get this thing put together. While you are set up to do this, if you're gonna be making multiples, this is how you make money with woodworking. This is what it comes down to, is being able to repeat a quality product in the least amount of time. Time is money. Time is always money. Again, do not put out a crappy product just to you know, hurry through this, but do things that make sense. Like if I were making 10 of these, let's go ahead while I'm at this station, I already have my drill chucked up for this 3 8 hole. Why rechuck it with something else and go through the whole process? Just do this step over and over and over until it's done. Then you have all of these stacked up ready to go on to the next step. So the first of our jigs. So these are gonna be for the 12 inch pieces. In these little 12 inch pieces, there's actually quite a few screws. One of them, there's actually five screws in. This is just a little thin piece of probably quarter inch material that uh, I'm gonna be using as my jig. When you're making jigs, make sure to put some bright color writing or some bright color spray paint on them so you don't accidentally throw them away. I also like to put little loops on them, hang them on the wall, things like that. So, the way this will work is this was our stock piece, 12 inches, jig 12 inches. What I found by making several of these is that at 29 inches up, which is going to be your first crossbar, the spacing, it's not a pretty jig, but it works. The spacing will be exactly this. So each one of these holes are spaced two and a quarter inches apart. So the math works out at 29 inches up from my very center one to be going into my center board. And remember, the center board for these trellises will always be completely vertical. All of these cross members that we will add, there will be a center point so that will keep that center board in the middle of this trellis and to make sure that we have a 90 degree reference point to go off of. So this is where the clamps come in. So I'm just gonna take my jig and I'm not gonna do this for every single piece because you get the point. We'll line this up. This is where the drill press, if you have one, would come in super handy because you can mark all of this and knock out several uh, without changing anything. But it looks something like this. As long as it stays in place, it really doesn't matter. So this is keeping you from having to remeasure every single one. So let me... I'm just using the pre-drilled holes in my jig to follow along. And there we have our five holes perfectly centered, drilled there. And we would do the same thing for our next piece. This cross member will only have three holes. Have everything marked, which way goes up. But do you see how much faster this would be rather than measuring every single one? I know that these are centered. I took the time to measure this out, center everything, and that's the power of jigs. You can take something, do it one time, and you can increase your speed for production by tenfold, if not more. So now you can see the power of how the jig came into play here. We drilled eight holes that I did not have to measure. I just know that they're right because the jig tells me that that's right. The jig is where I took my time. The jig is where I actually measured everything, made sure everything was centered. That way I did not have to do that for every single one of these. I'm not gonna do it on the longboard because you get the point. So let's get these countersink. And again, when you're countersinking, this would probably be the fastest option 
to drill and countersink at the same time. And if you were going to use something like this, instead of drilling through the jig, I would just take my pencil and make a pencil mark. Then I could check this into my drill or my drill press and just go to town. And if you're using a drill press, you can actually set the depth. That way every single one is exactly uniform. But for this video, I'm gonna be using this little countersink bit because they're typically a little bit more affordable. So if I had several more of these to do, I would not be changing bits. I would still be doing this. Take my jig off, put it back onto another one. Take it off, put it back onto another one. So when we are countersinking, we just want to make sure that our screw head will actually fit and not stick up above the surface of the material. So when you're finding your countersink bit, just make sure that it will completely allow the screw that you're using to countersink. So let's get these knocked out. And there we have it. So another quick tip to speed things up when you go for assembly. Once you have these all cut out, instead of having all kinds of these screws that you're fumbling around with while you're actually trying to bend these different limbs of this. So before we go into the next step, we are going to get all of these screws just started. That way they're in place and ready to be fastened to the fans. Okay, so this is my main jig and you really do not need all of this. Um, these are just little things that I've added on and I'll explain as I go to actually make this go quicker. This jig will actually help us to stretch and bend this trellis while we're screwing it all together. All of these screws are actually placed in the exact spots that they need to be to hold the limbs because they're gonna to want to try to rebound back in because of the pressure that's being held against them. So let me show you how this works. Okay, so with our jig in place, I can line the bottom of our very first grouping that we did, the five that are bolted together, up with the bottom of this jig. And I have a couple just screws at an angle holding this in just to keep it from going back and forth. So we'll put our first bundle here into the jig. And this is the fun part. This is where you're gonna find out if you have any hidden knots or uh, any fractures inside of the wood when we go to stretch this out. The hardest one of this whole fan is gonna be these outside edges. So sometimes I like to actually take this screw out that I have to hold it into place. The bottom's not gonna move because I have two screws here keeping it from wanting to pull as I pull pressure this way. So I can just put a screw back in once I get this into place. The first one's gonna be pretty easy because there's not gonna be any tension. So I'll just take my very first limb and bring it out real slow to the other side of that screw. So it's locked into place. Now the next one that I want to do will actually be this one. And this one's actually gonna be the hardest one to get into place. It's not gonna be hard to pull, but if something's going to break, if it's going to give, um, it's gonna be this one, because it's gonna have the most pressure on it. So I actually like to take this screw out, then I'll have this ready for putting it back in once I get it to my point. And we just stretch. And there it is. And that will hold it into place. And now you just repeat the steps with the screws that are already in here. Just pull it to the outer edge. Pull it to the outer edge and the center one is lined up. The fan is actually formed now without anything else holding it into place except for the jig. And this is where this jig comes in so handy. It would be very difficult to get, you know, all of these parts on here if this was constantly trying to move. So it's holding it in place. So let's go ahead and get these on. And I want to show you my other two jigs real quick. These are just spacers. From the bottom of this trellis up, it's going to be 29 inches into our very first cross beam. And it's going to be the five one. So it's going to be 29 inches up. I'm just going to set that there for a moment. And then it's going to be another 16 inches up until we get our second one. It'll be like this. And then our top one is 16 inches up from that. But what I have done in this jig, if you notice these two little parts that stick up, 
This is going to allow me to place this exactly where it needs to be to line up just by pushing down on this and lining it up with the, the top bar. I'm gonna start by putting my top cross member on first, then this jig, it will actually just be a spacer. You really don't need these, uh, but I did it because I was tired of my board falling down and hitting the floor, so it just kind of stays in place. And this spacer will be 16 inches, and then I can use it again down here for another 16 inches because I know that they are 16 inches apart. And I'm always going to start with my center on each piece. That is where that screw needs to be in order for the rest of the screws to line up. I always keep a speed square in my pocket or close by because all of these boards need to be square with center, and this board will be our center point. This is why I was talking about um, in the beginning, while it was so important to make sure that this one stayed vertical. Okay, so for our next one, this is my 16 inch spacer. We're just gonna put this in our next board and we will square it with the center and our spacer. And then we can use our last spacer. It's really not necessary. We could actually have just used that one again, but I have it, so we'll use it. And there we have it. This thing is put together. I mean, it's done. The only thing we have to do is take it out of the jig, and that is where all of these jigs make these things so fast. Uh, with this jig, I had all of my parts pre-drilled, you know, I can probably assemble this thing in a couple of minutes, if even that, using this jig. The jigs take the longest to make, but once they are made, repeat, repeat, repeat. You knock out tons of these things and that's where you make money. So another common question that I have was, how do you stick these things into the ground? A lot of people don't. They'll put them up against their buildings, they'll put them up against anything that uh, has a climbing plant. But for those that do want to put it in the ground, I would just do something like this. Just take a piece of my scrap that I had left over because these things are only, you know, seven foot long and throw a couple of screws in. This is gonna be completely up to you whether you decide to do this, add it in, or you can just, you know, tape it to it or, or however, and it just comes with it and being an option. Or you could actually put it into place, start your first screw, top screw, and pivot it up out of the way because you do not want this sticking out, you know, while you're trying to transport it, while these greenhouses or wherever they're at, you know, while they're trying to display it, they do not want, you know, this long stake sticking out, making everything off balance and falling and all of that stuff. So this is what I've done in the past. Do that and they can just flip it down if they would like to actually use the stake. Then the customer can put this last screw in to actually make it a stake. Uh, probably the best option would just be to send it with the unit, you know, just tape it on there or you can put a piece of grass string or something like that um, and just send it as an option. Never fails. If it's not on there, somebody's going to ask, how do you put this into the ground? And it is as easy as that with my jigs in place and all of my parts cut, which does not take that much time once you get your assembly line going, making all of the parts at once. I can put one of these together in a very, very short time period. And when you show the customer what they're getting, you'll be very impressed with the quality of this. You know, people nowadays, they're getting used to low quality uh, items. If it's a handmade item and it's high quality, I mean, it's a sale. Well guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Again, this is one of many ways to make money with woodworking. And right now is the time to be pumping these out if you're choosing to make these. One of the things that people will spend money on besides their children or their pets is gardens. Gardens, flowers, anything that someone enjoys you know getting out of the house they're going to spend money on it have you seen the prices of the flowers why would someone pay forty dollars for a climbing plant that's going to die and not be willing to pay 50 60 70 or higher for something for that plant and for the plant for the next year and the next year and the next year like this 
I'm telling you, I've done it, I've seen it, I've sold them, these things sell. So I hope this helped a little bit, guys. Thank you so much for watching, as always. Until next time, go out there, build things, get off your butt, you've got this, make some money. It's there, it's waiting for you. See ya.